Hello, I'm Glenn Richardson and I am Senior Lecturer in History at St Mary's University College, which is in Twickenham in West London. And here I specialise in early modern British and French history in particular, uh, the reign of Henry VIII. Um, the book which I published fairly recently uh, is uh, Renaissance Monarchy and it's three kings for the price of one, Henry VIII, Francis I and Charles V. So I come at Henry VIII from a, a comparative point of view, from a, a European kingship point of view. And the particular question which I'm going to be talking about today is how far did Henry VIII achieve his aims during the period from 1509 to 1514? So that's the early part of his reign, obviously. Uh, well, to answer that question, I think we need to think about what Henry thought of as, as his job as being as King of England. Uh, he was born in 1491 and uh, he was educated from the age of about seven formally, uh, which is 1498, he turned seven and he started lessons with a poet of his father's court, John Skelton, with whom he did chivalric romances and poetry, a bit of history, a bit of languages, uh, particularly French and Latin, which were the languages which uh, all young noblemen and to some extent women were also taught in this period, part of the new fashion for what they called the Studia Humanitatis, what we now call the Humanities. And Henry very much enjoyed those lessons with Skelton. And then when he was a bit older, he began uh, work with uh, two other tutors who he had. And these three uh, mentors and, and professors that he kind of worked with, as it were, um, led him to develop ideas of what his kingship could, sh should consist of. And it really comes down to, to two things which then affect his aims. The first is that he should be, uh, I suppose, popular, loved, uh, respected by the English nobility. Uh, don't forget that he is originally the second son, his elder brother Arthur, of course, uh, who was married to Catherine of Aragon, and as we know, a lot followed from that, unfortunately died in 1502. And so Henry found himself, unexpectedly, heir to the throne. And from that time onwards, uh, his education and his outlook was very much informed by the fact that he knew he was going to be, in all likelihood, king when Henry VII uh, duly died. And so being not popular in the modern sense, but certainly respected and a figurehead for the nobility in England was really what he was very much interested in being. But he also wanted to look abroad. He also he was aware very much that England was part of a, a European scene. Uh, that education that I was talking about had led him to appreciate that. And the history which he'd learned, particularly the history of, of um, the English kings, um, Henry V, the great victor of Agincourt, gave him a sense that he wanted to make his name not just in England, but on the international stage, that he wanted to be a serious contender on the European stage. So we'll come back to that uh, a bit later. So uh, the aims which he has are formed very much by his education, which is part of this, as I was saying, this Studia Humanitatis, uh, which he's grown up in. Henry, we should also remember, uh, was in a sense built for kingship. Uh, even as a teenager, he was quite tall. Eventually, he was six foot one, which was not that tall uh, compared to many other nobles of the time. It's a bit of a myth that we all think people were about four foot high in the Middle Ages. Um, because the nobility ate a lot of meat, a lot of protein, uh, many of them did grow um, to quite considerable size, both up and out. Henry, of course, being pretty famous for that. Um, but he was, even as, a, as an adolescent, uh, tall. He was a bit like a rugby player. He had broad shoulders and he was very aware of his physical capabilities. Uh, he would have been trained alongside with those lessons in you know, grammar and French and poetry, literature, history, all those things that he was brought up with. He would also have spent a lot of time practicing the arts of kingship. And that means he would have spent his afternoons, for example, hunting, going uh, outside Windsor Castle or Richmond, uh, in the hunting park at Richmond, or perhaps at, at um, what we now think of as St James's near Whitehall, where he would have practiced hunting deer uh, and other animals. Uh, later on in life, he very much enjoyed hunting, hunting with hawks, what they called hawking or, or falcons, and he did a bit of that when he was young. Uh, but his favourite sport was the paramilitary sports, um, particularly the paramilitary sport of, of jousting. He was not allowed to joust by his father, particularly when he was the only son and heir to the kingdom, because jousting is a very, very dangerous sport. 
think of any dangerous sport you can think of now and double it because it involves uh, a lot of armour, spears, although they were blunted, they were still being pushed at, at your opponent with great force. People were often injured, often hurt when they fell off horses or injured by the splintering of, of the, the lancers. So it was a very dangerous sport. Henry loved it and practised everything that led up to jousting, but he didn't finally joust publicly, at least, until after he became king. And even then, he did it in a bit of a disguise in uh, 1510. But he did everything, as I was saying, short of that. So he did something called running at the ring, which is where you have to try and get to your the, the uh, spear or the, the lance which you're uh, carrying through a very, very small target, and it, it's good target practice. So he did a lot of that. General horsemanship, riding, jumping, all that kind of thing. So when we think of, of Henry's aims and how he formulates them, we've got to think of the, the mental development uh, and the physical development of, of the king. I think we also need to think a bit about the emotional development of Henry. As I said, when he is born, he's the second son, he's not that important, everybody's interested in Prince Arthur, who's the Prince of Wales, and Henry is the sort of Duke of York. But even when he's quite young, as young as three, he's knighted, he's made Duke of York, and remember that there's a number of pretenders um, against Henry the VII, um, and uh, Perkin Warbeck claims to be uh, the, uh, the Duke of York one of the princes in the tower um, who's miraculously appeared and Henry the seventh has really got to face that down and he uses Henry the eighth more or less to say look if you want a Duke of York this is the this is the real Duke of York Henry the Duke of York uh, he's made a knight of the garter uh, and all these other things that he has even as a young boy the education which I was talking about however takes place in a fairly private world and a world which um, is dominated by women, essentially. He lives at Elton Palace in what is now South East London, where he is brought up in a household uh, governed by his mother, Elizabeth of York, Henry VII's wife, and with, the, with her sisters and their ladies-in-waiting, uh, responsible for bringing up not only uh, Henry, but also his sisters Margaret and Mary. Prince Arthur, of course, has already gone off to be the Prince of Wales, uh, based at Ludlow. So Henry grows up very much the centre of attention, and very much the centre of this world, which may help us to understand perhaps something about why he is quite self-centred, why he is quite egotistical uh, in his outlook on life. And all of this, I think, is really uh, important for understanding uh, what his aims were and to what extent he achieved them. So the first aim is really to capture the loyalty and the um, support of the nobility, because we're talking about a time, as Henry VII well knew, where monarchy really depended upon the nobility and gentry to support it. There was no police force, there's no cameras, there's no you know, CCTV, there's no uh, elaborate civil service, there's nothing really except the mystique of the monarchy and such administrative capacity as it's got to enforce its will. So it has to work with a royal council, the king has to work with a council, the king has to work with parliament, with the judges, the JPs in the counties, and all of that depends not on some elaborate theory of government, although there were theories about, but on personal connections between people uh, up and down the social hierarchy, from the lowest squire all the way up to the king himself. And that's really what Henry seems to have cottoned onto very early. And he's very good at it because, as I was saying earlier, he's got that physical stature, that presence. Uh, people are reminded of, uh, when they look at him, they're reminded of his um, grandfather, Edward of York, and they think, you know, he's, a, he's another uh, fine example of kingship. And uh, so he sets about achieving that first aim quite quickly. He displays himself uh, publicly quite a lot uh, from his first days as king uh, in public processions, of course, for the coronation, and then afterwards, as I was saying, at tournaments, uh, and when he goes hunting, uh, in, particularly in the summer. Uh, one of his earliest progresses, or his summer holidays, as it were, when he journeys out from London to other parts of the kingdom, uh, are deliberately designed to, to give him the opportunity to see his kingdom and be seen by the nobles uh, of his realm. And people are very impressed. We can refer back to statements by William Blount, Lord Mountjoy, who was a sort of friend and, and mentor to the young king, or perhaps more famously Sir Thomas More, or the great Dutch uh, scholar Erasmus, all of whom are incredibly impressed with the potential of this uh, finely built, intelligent, sensitive uh, young man. 
which is why, which as we've been recalling particularly this year, 2009, with the uh, quincentenary of his accession, um, the great promise that Henry seemed to show uh, to the world uh, when he became king. So he seems to succeed in his first aim to connect with the English nobility very well. He'd been trained for it by his father, by his education and by his disposition, and he does a good job. But what does he do with that? Well, the second thing, I guess, his second aim, is to ensure continuity of government, stability, uh, peaceful collection of taxation, avoidance of all the kinds of problems that, that early modern kings can, can have. And here, too, the record is, is pretty good. He inherits a, a royal council, which is composed of much older men, you know, people who, uh, I suppose, are in their 40s and 50s. Once I used to think that was very old. I'm not so sure anymore. But uh, older men, certainly, than Henry but men who are very committed to maintaining the peace and stability which Henry VII had fought very hard to achieve after the, uh, the, the battles of the Wars of the Roses and his successful claiming of the kingdom in 1485. And so Henry has that, he has a stable system of government, Parliament meets uh, regularly when he needs it to, uh, Parliament votes taxes for the defence of the realm fairly regularly, uh, so in, in a sense Henry has a lot to thank his father for, for re-establishing good, strong, effective monarchy. Uh, the judges in the localities and in Westminster Hall working on the whole um, according to the rules and justice is seen to be done reasonably well uh, in the circumstances. So that's the second aim and through the period of which we're talking, 1509 to 1514, Henry does that very well. Henry's real drive though in this early part of his reign, as I was saying earlier, is as much to do with achieving glory for himself and a personal reputation as a great monarch. Being a good governor, uh, maintaining peace, order, stability, justice, they're all very good. Uh, maintaining an interesting and um, entertaining court uh, where people can be uh, able to have access to the king, to seek favours, to prefer members of their family, to make all those little connections, as I was saying, between the king and the nobility. That's all going very well for the king in the first half dozen years of his reign. But what does he really want to do? <clears throat> he really wants to make his name in Europe through attacking the ancient enemy, of course, France. If you remember I was saying about he uh, was brought up with uh, reading chivalric stories and histories with Skelton. Well, now he really wants to make those come true, and he wants to be another Henry V. Um, if you'd gone into Henry VIII's or Henry Prince of Wales's bedroom as a young uh, lad, he would have had um, not the obviously the the um, English football captain on on his uh, wall, but he would have had a poster of Henry V, uh, the, the great hero of Agincourt, and this is desperately what he wants to be.